Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. This is going to be a lot of fun. This is an engineer's pragmatic guide to design, and I hope this is fun for you all today. I want to start out with uh, a couple of examples of design that got me interested in design. So this is a bit of a pop quiz. Who here knows what this device is? Raise your hand. Yeah. You in the front row. What is this? Uh, it's a mouse. It's a, it's a mouse. What is famous about this mouse? I need to shout it out. It's round. What's wrong with a round mouse? You grab it, you try to go up, it goes sideways, the cursor. This is the mouse I taught my grandmother how to use a computer with, and it shaped my experience of that whole computer. This made me want to get into design. Uh, two more examples, a little bit of a pop quiz here. Who knows what this is? Comic Sans. Comic Sans. You can't do a design talk without talking a little bit about Comic Sans, right? What is Comic Sans good for? Nothing. Nothing. No, come on, I'm not a hater. What is Comic Huh, comics? Yes? Is it good for stuff like this? <laughs> it's making them a little bit more approachable, I think, a little more friendly. Uh, this makes me want to get into design. Now I'm going to show you my favorite dialogue of all time. I'll read it to you. The Adobe Updater must update itself before it can check for updates. Would you like to update the Adobe Updater now? <laughs> I, I think they missed an opportunity to put at least one more update in this dialogue. I think the button should have said update. So. All this stuff made me want to get into design, and it's really easy to find examples of bad design and poke fun at. That is super easy. It's a lot harder to actually do good design in, in your team. Um, and for me, I think one of the hardest parts was coming from engineering and then going into design and dealing with that culture shock. Because I sort of came in and saw all these people with these fancy glasses, and they're playing with post-it notes all day. And if you get a couple of them together, it sort of look, looks, looks like they're going to a competitive plaid competition. I don't know if you've had that experience. In the, I live in the Mission, so it's like that all the time. Uh, I got to thinking, who are these aliens? Like, what is their culture like? How are we going to build stuff together? Um, and it's kind of scary. Don't panic, though. That is what we're going to talk about today, hopefully. Um, most people who give talks like this, uh, oh, I was going to say, I worked at Google for a while. You heard all the stuff that Sam said. Uh, then I went to Google Ventures about three years ago. So I've got a good chance to see how engineering cultures work with design. And now that I've worked with startups for the past three years, I get to see a lot of the ways startups and designers work together. So hopefully we can share some of that stuff today. I'm up on this kind of big stage, but I want this to be a conversation. So if you feel like you've got a question or want to talk about something, just shout it out or raise your hand. We'll, we'll chat about it. Sound good? Cool. Most people who give talks about design to engineers give sort of a design 101 talk. I think this is boring, so we're not going to do this at all. Uh, the problem with this is there's so much to learn about design, you really can't talk all about it in 40 minutes. And so it ends up just being trite stuff. I also promise this will be the last use of Comic Sans in the whole presentation. I think. We'll see. Um, what I do want to do, though, is focus not on where we're different, where our skill sets are different, but where, what we have in common. And the thing I, I think we have most in common is that we are all builders. You know, we're not scientists searching for some truth in nature, and we're not artists searching for some truth in humanity. We're builders. We're makers. We want to make the world a better place through the things that we, we build together. So I think we have a lot in common there. And I think that we should focus on how we work together better. Now, that's what I want to talk about today for a little bit. And I want to break it into three different parts. First, how are we going to dance? Like, if we're going to work together as engineers and designers, what does that process look like? Because we both have a huge amount of process in our, in our work. The second thing I want to talk about is, how do you find a dance partner? Like, what do you need from a designer when you're hiring them? Or what should you look for in a design team as, as you start to build it? And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the environment. What culture surrounds us in the companies where we work, and how that affects whether we can, we can do great design. That make sense? Kind of? All right, I'm going to start with talking about uh, process. Because you know, back when I was studying engineering, I learned that there's so much process that goes into it. And that's helped us you know, reduce defects, get better at planning, speed up our, uh, our progress. Process is a huge part of doing engineering. Um, and it's actually a huge part of doing design as well. It's one of the things that allows a design firm, I've always marveled at this, design firms will sit down and design a medical device one month, and next month they'll design a lounge chair. And you're like, how, did you, how do you do both of those things? The way they manage to do both is put together a design process that works from, from context to context to context, context repeatedly. So the good news is that when you look at 
both of those processes, what, what engineers do and designers do, they'll both say, hey, we're totally iterative. Which is great, right? We should, we should be able to work together very easily. But when you actually start to do the work and put people in the same room together and say, let's go at it, let's build something, you find a lot of conflict. And I think this is the biggest conflict that you usually see is that designers think engineers are inflexible. They never want to change the things that they've built or throw them away. And, uh, and engineers, they think designers are these indecisive people. Who's, who's, who's had this before, this conflict in their teams? Yeah, so it's pretty common. I, I think it's pretty common. I've thought about this a lot, and I think one of the core reasons for it, even though we're both very iterative in our process, I think we iterate in slightly different ways. I think engineers iterate more like this. We build one solid part at a time. So if we're building a house, we'll build the foundation, learn a lot from building that foundation, and then we'll move on to the walls. Designers tend to iterate in a very different way. We destruct, destruct a large, uh, complex problem, not by breaking it into the individual parts, but by approaching the whole thing at a very low level of fidelity. So we'll sketch the entire house, and it'll be a really crappy sketch. And then we'll paint the whole house, and then we'll build a little model of the whole house. So we, we work on the whole thing at a time and slowly make it more and more and more real. You can imagine if you're just taking apart the problem one way with one set of people and then iterating the other way with another set of people, you get some conflict there. Now, the way this actually appears in practice, I think, with a lot of teams is we do something like this. We say, we're going to start a team. All right, we've got our designers over here. You ready? Engineers over here, you ready? All right, go. Go build something. And so this is our timeline. You know, we're get everyone at the same time. We set our goals and we hope that it all works out and we launch at the same time. The problem in practice is that after a couple of iterations, design usually finds out some interesting things about what the product needs to be. We built something, we showed it to people, it turns out they don't want quite that. We thought it was going to work and then we drew a few pictures and it turns out it doesn't work so well. And we learn a lot through this early part of the process. And what that means is sometimes we've been building the wrong stuff. And that's horrible. Because then you've got to make this decision about whether you start over and push the launch date out, throw away your code, that's horrible. Or you just launch it anyways. You're like, well, we know this isn't exactly what people want, but let's hit our launch date, let's get it out the door. I've seen both of these things happen. And it's horrible. This is, this is what I call product churn. This is the thing that you want to avoid at all, at all cases. Um, there's a bunch of ways to, to start to avoid this. But I think one of, the, one of the biggest ways that we can avoid it is by giving design a little bit of a head start. I'm not saying a huge head start, but give them a chance to get through a little bit of that design process early on before we start uh, a huge amount of engineering work. So I'm not saying at all that, that waterfall is the right approach. Like, I've seen that not work many times where you get the specs and you throw it over the wall to engineering. What I'm suggesting is more like pipelining. And I've seen this work pretty well where the design team is constantly being a little bit ahead of where the engineering team is. And when you get that pipelining just right, you, uh, you very much reduce the amount of churn that you get into the engineering organization. So give them a little bit of a head start. Second thing I want to talk about in process is actually to dive a little bit into what designers do with their time during the day. Like, they're off in a corner with their headphones on behind their Apple monitors doing stuff. What, what is it that they're doing? Um, because I think there's a couple parts in there where we, we get a lot of stress between where that process hits up against the engineering process. So here's a very, very simplified model of how most design teams work. First of all, we gather data about what customers need. We go and talk to them. We, look at, we do surveys sometimes. We'll look at logs analysis when we have them. We'll gather as much data as we can about the problem. Then we generate a bunch of ideas. Because we know that usually the first idea you come up with might not be the right one, so we spend a lot of time generating ideas. And then we focus down to some that might work, which is really hard because sometimes you don't know which ones are going to work. But then you build something. You force yourself to build even though you don't know what is exactly right. And you do that because you can loop it back into the process, show it to people, and make sure you're on the right track. So early on in a project, there's a lot of variability as you go around this loop. And then later on, you're just kind of fixing small usability problems. There's less variability that you pass on to engineering. So if you're an engineer and you've got a design team kind of running through this, I wouldn't worry about this side of the, the board. Like, designers have this covered. We'll go away with our headphones on and generate a bunch of ideas and focus it down. Where the conflict typically happens is on this other side of the cycle. This is where um, we need a lot of help from engineers to make things run smoothly. And the biggest thing, I think, is usually in this build something category. Um, part of that is because designers often don't have the skills necessary to build all the types of prototypes that we need. We can 
we can play around in Photoshop, we can do some stuff in Keynote, some of us can do a little coding in JavaScript, but for the most part we can't do large high scale prototypes that actually help us tell if we're on the right track. And the challenge with this is, if you're going through the early part of a process, oftentimes designers think, hey, I'm building this V1 product, I'll be able to loop through it a couple times. And you tell an engineer that we're doing a V1, they're thinking, this is V1, it's going to be this awesome thing and we're going to ship it and people are going to love it. And the designer is thinking like, this is V1, we're going to build this thing and hopefully people want hugs and they don't want hugs, it's okay, we'll scrap it and do something else. And when you have this breakdown between, hey, this is going to be great, people are going to love it and well, we'll see, that's where you get that same type of tension again. That's why I think prototyping is important. Can we talk, we talk a lot about prototyping in the valley and all sorts of places that we go, but I'm curious, this is how I de design a proto or define a prototype. It's something that you write with the intention to throw away. You know it's not going to be part of your product. I'm curious, how many people in the last 30 days have built a prototype? Oh wow, that's pretty good actually. I would say like a quarter to a fifth of the room have done that. That's great. Because the more that we do that, the, the faster we can get around this design cycle. So thank you all for, for working on that type of stuff. That makes your designers very, very happy. The other part where I think we get into a lot of issues is, is around gathering data. Um, we're all opinionated about what a product should be. We all are very um, uh, committed to making our product high quality. But I think oftentimes we forget how different we are from the people that we're building for. So if you're building a product, you're building it for sort of this average person, this, this, this Joe six pack, right? If I'm building a photo sharing site, I want it to be for, for most people. But us in this room, we're weird. We're so weird. We're a couple standard deviations away from normal. We're, we're like overeducated, we're paid well, there's free food. <laughs> the weather is always good here. It's crazy. How many people here have more than one smartphone? Come on. <laughs> weird, right? Like I, I think that we've just passed half of Americans having smartphones and we have two, that's crazy. So the needs that we see are so different than the needs that our customers see. I don't know, if you're like me, it gets even worse. If you've started to work on a project for like six months and you're really into it and you have a beer with your friend and try to explain to them why you're excited about it, they're like, what are you talking about? So we, we get in these little tiny bubbles and it's so difficult for us to see the world like our customers see the world. They see it all the time. I call that design blindness. And designers typically call that empathy. That gap between the way we see the world and the way the person we're building our product for sees the world. Well, the good news is there's all sorts of ways we can close that gap. That's not a problem. We can do user studies, we can talk to users, we can do usability stuff, we can look at behavioral analysis and logs. There's lots of ways to close that gap. The challenge is making sure that everyone knows that gap exists. Because when we know that gap exists, it allows us to go um, and spend time and effort closing that gap. So this has been all kind of a little theoretical and I want to I give an example of a time in my career where this actually worked really well. I was working on the first version of Gmail chat and this seems I think kind of old hat right now because people do chat on the web all the time but this is the first time people really did chat on the web that worked. And uh, this is the very first UI that we had for doing chat. It looks a lot like the uh, windows we had, uh, we, you can see in the product today. We actually call them uh, chat moles. If you ever play that game Whack-A-Mole where they keep popping up and you whack them down, that's what we call them because they kind of whacked up and you had, to, you had to get rid of them by answering people's messages. And the whole team was using this and it was working really well for everyone, everyone on the Gmail team. No problem, right? We should just launch it. Well, someone had the smart idea to bring in some users. Uh, and so we spent some time here as an engineer and we're, we're looking at people try this for the first time. What we did is we sent them a message without their knowledge that they, it was chat even enabled in their account and saw what they did with it. And it turned out that this was a big failure. Can anyone guess why this didn't work? Shout it out if you have any guess. Come on. What's that? You know, the controls are on the bottom. It turned out that people, even though it's kind of a weird spot for controls, they actually figured out how to use those. So that was good. But there was something else that was really, really a problem. What was that? No smileys. no smileys. You know, that was a huge request, especially in Japan, but no, that was not a, a, a key problem in this one. Uh, no, I'll give you a hint. It popped up and people typed their answer and then they just stared at it. No send button. 
Every chat program at this point had a send button on it. And then us designers were like, you know, this thing covers your mail. We don't want to add another button, a whole other row. Plus, you can use enter on the keyboard. Turns out, people didn't know how to hit enter on the keyboard. So we thought, oh, we're going to solve this. Like, we're, we're so smart. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a big yellow box that says, type in the box below, then press enter to press send your message to chat. <laughs> right? This is, can't fail. This is going to work. Uh, we showed us people's giant failure. Does anyone know why this one didn't work? This is a little bit harder. What's that? No one reads. That's very close. No one read this. I'll tell you what happened. We'd send them a message, it would pop up, and they would close it. So we'd send them another message, it would pop up, and they would close it right away without reading it. And we said, what is going on there? People said, I hate these pop-up ads. <laughs> So we made it such a salient user tip that everyone thought we were shouting at them and it must be spam. So finally, after three iterations of working on this stuff, uh, we have a, you, you won't notice this in your account today because it goes away after you learn how to do it. There's a little 10 pixel thing in gray that says press enter to send your message. That's all we needed. We need to whisper, not shout. The reason I bring up this whole story is because that difference between the very first thing I showed and this thing it's really minor. I don't think any of us in advance could have guessed that that was the thing that was wrong or that this was the right solution for it. And it was only by going through that process a couple different times that we were able to get from something that worked for our team to something that worked for, the, for millions and millions of people. And the reason we were able to do that was because we had support from our engineering team over here. Like designers are, are great at this stuff, but think about it. Our engineering team built those three different versions of it before launching it. That was awesome. And then they sat in the user study room and watched us gather data and watched it fail over and over again. If we didn't have support from our engineering team like that, you wouldn't be using as good of a chat product today. I think that's amazing. So that's a little bit about how I think about process from engineering and design and how they fit together. The second thing I want to talk about a little bit is how you find a designer and what you should look for. Um, I think any startup, when they start and they realize that design is important, they start interviewing some people, they, they very quickly realize that there's a broad range of design skills. I think there's six big ones, and I think they're this. I think you have to care about visual design, how your product looks, and I think you have to care about interaction design, all the details and flows about how it works. So usually those people think about those two, but there's a bunch more. If you think about user research, how do you go out and talk to users on a regular basis so you're always getting a good stream of data about what's broken and what you need to do next? How do you ask questions in ways where you know you'll get good data from people? You certainly want someone who studied anthropology or psychology to work on that problem with you. Writing. Honestly, most of our UIs are, are words, really. And any new startup is trying to convey a brand new idea into someone's head, and they only have a couple, different, a couple seconds to do it. So if you're not very clear and concise with your language and consistent across your product, you can start having problems. Finally, there's UI development. It's amazing how many places I've gone into, and no one loves writing HTML and JavaScript. I'm like, oh man, this is, could be a problem. It's challenging because you need to do it not only uh, in a way that will never break, but also in a way and that's fast, but the big thing is you need to make it flexible because as you're discovering what is the right solution, you're going to have to change the code over and over and over again to get to that good solution. So building it in a way that allows you to do that is so important. The last thing I look for in, in designers is this thing that we're starting to call product design. I sort of think of that as someone that understands how all these pieces fit together, understands how to, to balance design goals with, with business goals, and really understand some of the process stuff I talked about up front, how to get engineers and designers and all sorts of people in the company working together. So that's a lot of skills, right? What most startups do when they realize all these skills are necessary is they write a job rack and they say, we're looking for a lead designer, you must have, be an expert in all these skills. Designers have a word for what they're looking for here. And I hear the box people, this is, this is your motto or your, uh, your, uh, your spirit animal. Anyone know what the word for this is? Yeah, the unicorn. I mean, if you're using Keynote, you have to use a couple of transitions like that. Uh, so what do you think? Do, do unicorns exist? Yes? <laughs> uh, how many designers are in here today? I'm curious. Oh, awesome. Cool. Leave your hands up, designers, so everyone can look around and see you. All right. Now keep your hands up if you're a unicorn. If you consider yourself good at all those things. Cool. Hire those people. <laughs> That's great, that's great. So I actually do think that there are unicorns. I think there are people that are good at all that stuff. Problem is they're hard to find. 
They're usually pretty expensive. Nice work. Um, I think the bigger problem is, though, that even if you find someone that's a unicorn, there's not enough hours in the day to actually do all of those things well for any, any reasonably sized product. So the honest truth is, in order to do great design, you need a design team. Ooh, there we go. Um, I think you really do need a design team to cover all of those skills. Um, I know that that's, sounds uh, easier than it actually is to, to make happen. Designers are very hard to attract to your company these days. They're hard to recruit. So for, for a long time, you may have to work in a situation where you don't have all of those skills covered. You don't have enough of a design team to do the work. So let's talk a little bit about what you do in those situations. I think there's two, two big things that happen when you have less design resources than you need. The first is that you don't have all those skills covered. And in this situation, I really think teams should mine the gap. And what I mean by that is, so let's say you have one good interaction designer. So this is kind of my, my sweet spot. I'm, I'm good at interaction design, but I'm not good at all those other things. So if I'm working at a startup, what I want to do is find other people on the team to do those other design skills and support me as much as possible. That might mean having your sales team or even your CEO take regular customer visits and figure out what's working or not. That might mean hiring a, a contractor to do some visual design. Whatever it is, backfill all of those skill areas and then you'll make the most out of the design resources you have. That's one thing to do. The other thing that happens very, very commonly is that the peanut butter is spread too thin and this is not a tasty outcome. Uh, the, this happens in big companies a lot, right? Because you'll get a design team of maybe two or three people, and then you realize, okay, we have to build an Android app, and an iPhone app, and a web thing, and a desktop thing. Oh, by the way, we're shipping four different versions this quarter, and there's no way that a small, a small design team can support all of that to a high quality. So what they do is they switch into what I call make it suck less mode. I don't know if you've ever had to work in that mode where stuff is coming along and you can't actually fix it well. You can just put a little bit of frosting on it. Um, the way to get out of this is actually just to be amazing at one thing. So you may think that you could be good at, at making tacos and good at making pizzas, but you really can't do both well. <laughs> I'm at the Pizza Hut. Uh, the reason I suggest this, it's, it's painful, right? It's painful to say we're not going to help some team. It's painful to say we're not going to work on that feature. But it never really works to add people to a team that's not currently working. Right? If, if you've got this team and they're not turning out high quality design, it's, it becomes harder and harder to recruit people to your team. So, I don't know, I suggest focusing the team on, um, on one thing and doing it really well. And once you've got that template about how, it, how great design works in your company, then grow it back into the, all the scale that you need. That's how a little bit I, I think about hiring. Uh, I don't have all the time to talk about you know, what to look for in interviews, where to go and find designers and stuff, but we can talk about that afterwards. If, you're, if you guys are curious. Last thing I want to talk about, and I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this, is how to build a culture of design in your company. Part of that's because it's hard to recruit people unless you have that. And part of that is because I've worked in companies where it's hard to get design done. And, um, uh, or rather, in teams like that. And I don't stay on those teams very long. Um, I think it may sound a little fuzzy to say build a culture of design, but there are a couple uh, key things that we can do to make it way better. Now, I want to give you three examples of that. The first is uh, critique. I've been on teams where you, know, you work on designs, and, and you put them up on the wall, and you have people in, and they just tear them to shreds. They tell you all the things that are wrong with it, and you leave that meeting just like almost crying, and you just want to quit your job. That is not productive collaboration. But I've also been in companies that are on the other side of the fence where everyone's a little too careful with each other. Where they, they don't want to give each other real feedback because they're afraid they're going to hurt each other's feelings. Neither end of that spectrum is good. And when you talk to people generally about like, oh, your company culture, they'll say, oh, that's just like, that's just our culture. We can't change that. We hired a bunch of people and that's sad. It's really hard to change company culture. And I believed that for a long time. I thought, OK, that, that makes sense. I've, I know it's hard to change culture. But then I, I looked into the design team at a lot of places like this. And what I realized was that the design team in all these places was doing critique extremely well. And I was like, why is it the case that there's so much variability in, in critique in the broader organization, but in these little pockets, it's happening really well? 
So I asked the designers this and they said, well, they taught us in college. I went to my first design review and there were like 10 rules that we had to follow. And I guess I've just learned that stuff over time. It made me realize that design critiques are things that you can absolutely teach in your, in your organization. So I've done this a number of times with the organization. We've, we've, run, we've cultivated critique skills. And the way I suggest doing this is actually running a formal critique. There's all sorts of very good blog posts about how to run a design critique. Just find one person in your company and run it. Feels like a lot of process at first because you're making up rules and telling people what to do. But over time, that stuff just infuses into the rest of the culture and it becomes like a habit. So I'll just give you one kind of example about what makes a good design critique. Like if I, um, if I do design and I show it to you, I say like, what do you think? I'm sure you'll have stuff to say. Everyone's real opinionated about this stuff. But it might not be the things that I need um, to make a better design tomorrow. Instead, if I take that same design and I walk over to you and I say, tell you what, here's our goal. We're trying to get more click-throughs on this page. Here's our constraint. We've got one engineer to work on it for one day. And here's how far I've thought about it. I made some sketches at a cafe this weekend. Now that you know all three of those things, the goals, the constraints, and where I am in the process, you're so much better prepared to give me the feedback I need to make a better design. Just one example of stuff that you can make sure people do in a critique that gets them better feedback. When we have better feedback, we collaborate better, and that leads to better products. So I think this is actually, you know, it seems mysterious, but I think it's a pretty easy thing to do at companies. All right, two more things I want to talk about. Um, I was working with a CEO recently, and I, I'll admit I didn't know a whole lot of it about his product to start with. So I said, hey, why don't you print out a bunch of screens? Print out the screen that people see when they first come to your product, and then keep printing them out all the way until you think you've delivered a lot of value to that user. Just print them out, might be two dozen things, that's fine, bring it in. So we get in the morning and he starts laying them out on the, on the table kind of in a row. I go get a cup of coffee because it's early. And I come back and he goes, thank you, this is so valuable. And I'm thinking, we haven't even started yet, what are you talking about? But for him, this is the first time that he saw the flow that the user would take all the way through the product. And I realized that it's so easy for uh, engineers, for example, to destruct de their product into a bunch of different features. And designers, honestly, are no better. It's very easy for us to, to think of a product as a set of screens. We've got our 20 mock-ups of different screens that exist in the product, and that's what we think the product is. But people don't use the product like that at all. People use the product through these little flows and stories, threads through the product. And, um, and if we can fo force ourselves to think and critique our designs that way, it brings us so much closer to the way people actually use our products. One way I, I have started to think about this is a sort of code and test. So your code, you write it, it just sits there, it doesn't do anything. The test is the thing that exercises the code, makes it run, and makes sure it's doing the right thing. In fact, now we do test first design where you write the test first and then you write the code. And in many ways, I think we can start to design products that way first. But we know the task that people need to complete, and the product is the thing that has to make, support that, that task. So oftentimes we flip this in the, in the projects that we do. That sounds like a lot of work, but one simple forcing factor that you can make yourself do to think about this stuff more often is just make sure that you're never looking at a single screen in isolation. So that means if you're a designer, you never email a single screen. You're always emailing a set or a little movie of how something works. If you're giving a demo of a feature in a, in a meeting, you're always showing uh, how someone discovers it, how they use it for the first time, and, and how they learn all the parts about it. You're always telling a story. And if you do that, you'll be so much closer to the way people actually use your products. Last thing I want to talk about is actually the teams we have you know, with, within our product groups. A um, long time ago, back in the 80s, when we started to do software, we had our engineering teams, and they were focused on, qual on, uh, on speed. Uh, and then we realized we started to have software quality issues. Right? We were getting more and more bugs in the, soft in the software that we were building. So what did we do? We hired a testing team. We have these two teams, right? The first one we say, you know what, you're rewarded if, if you ship on time and ship all these features. And the second team we said, you're rewarded if there's no bugs. How do these teams get along? <laughs> yeah, not too well, unfortunately. What, what got us out of this mess with, with these teams that had very different goals was that we realized that quality wasn't this job that was, that was over here to the side. It's not that we could hire some testers, put them in the corner and say, it's your job to make sure our software is high quality. We sort of realized that quality was everyone's job on the team. And that meant that not everyone had to be an expert in software quality, but everyone had to be literate in it. 
And today, engineers write unit tests. They understand the basic core points of how to do software quality. And so today, software quality and engineering are so tied together that it's almost automatic. We almost don't have to think about it. But we care now about a slightly different kind of quality, right? We're worried that people might not find our products desirable or quite as easy to use or think they're quite as slick. So we hire a design team on the side. And we say, hey, engineers, you know, keep working on that high quality software, ship it as fast as possible. Hey, design team, it would be great if we had high quality. And these teams, of course, like, don't, work, don't work well together. I think we get out of this problem the same way we got out of the last problem. It's not that everyone has to be an expert at design, but we might have to get some basic literacy in design in a couple of areas. We might have to expand it so that design is more than just that small team's job on the side. And I think you're starting to see this. You're starting to see this because people are talking a lot about designers that code. And you're seeing this in job descriptions all over the place. What I'm surprised is that we're not seeing job descriptions for coders that design, or product managers that design. I'm looking forward to this and I think it's going to happen because what it means is that we'll get more design literacy in more places in the organization. And when we do that, we'll have that design literacy. Design will be everyone's job in the company and it becomes more automatic that you have that high quality all the time. So I want to leave you with a final thought. I've, uh, I've seen many teams uh, struggle with how design and engineering fit together. And the ones I've been most envious of when I say I really want to work with a team like that, are teams where those, those disciplines respect each other. I know that sounds a little cheesy, but to find a team where the designers really respect the engineers, they know when those engineers say, it's going to be very hard to build that, we don't have time, that they mean it. And it's equally great to find an engineering team that when the designers say, I really think the button should be over here, or that it should be blue, or that this feature can't make, make it into this into this release because it's not cohesive, that they trust their opinions on those things. And it's when people with very different skill sets respect each other's skill sets that you get the collaboration you need to build great design. So hopefully that helps us all dance a little bit better. Thank you. And I think we have a couple times for questions if anyone has, has one. Yeah, go ahead. How do you interview a designer? Um, I actually look for very uh, analytical people. Um, one of the biggest things I look for is I uh, first just ask people to help tell me about their, their projects. And what I listen for uh, is if they've told me what their goal was, what they did, and how they knew it worked. This is kind of this loop. Because if you're closing that loop, if, you ha if you're not just doing art, like making cool stuff, if you had some goal and you did it and you tested it, and you've done that a couple times, you're probably a pretty good designer. It's rare actually to find people that unprompted will go through all of those phases of product, but if you push them a little bit and there's good answers to all those things, it's a, it's a really good sign. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So I'll just repeat that a little bit. What, um, the question is, what's the best organizational structure for design? Um, I don't think there is a best. Uh, I think that uh, every, every organization within a big company tends to have incentives set for them. And what you're trying to do in, I think, big organizational structures is to balance those incentives so you get the outcomes you need in, in your process and or in, in your products. So. Engin the center of gravity, I think, for engineering is, is sort of speed uh, of execution. The center of gravity for product management, um, I think, also tends to be around uh, speed and capability in the same type of way. I think design offers a nice uh, quality metric on, on what we're shipping. And so any place that you can place design in an organization where it has enough weight to apply that, the, the focus on quality that you need, that's good. I've seen it go both ways, where designers are too in charge and they're too focused on quality, you never get anything out the door, and that's a problem. And I've seen it the other way too, where you're too focused on speed and the product isn't uh, high enough quality and no one wants to use it. And so I think you, you need to kind of adjust where design reports in the organization based on where you see uh, everything working. 
I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said that on the design teams we don't have enough resources to cover all those uh, six design skill sets uh, to be really good at one thing. Did you mean like one thing, like one product, or website, or the mobile app, or, or did you mean one thing, like the interaction or the visual design? Yeah, the question was when I, when I said to focus on just one thing, did I mean skills or did I mean more like products and features? I meant more products and features because I think that um, sort of like baby steps, right? If you can do, I mean, this is how you learn to be a designer is, I think there's two modes. One is uh, mentorship where you have someone take you along. The other mode is you radically reduce the scope until you can, you can do that thing well. So someone will say, great, design this dialogue. Okay, it's like not too many ways to mess up a dialogue. And so hopefully you can learn how to do that pretty well. And then a couple years later, they're like, design the suite of products. And hopefully you can do that well. I think the same thing happens for teams, where if, if you've got this team that's spread too thin and you're not doing high quality work, limiting the scope to a point where you can do quality work, and then being very thoughtful about how you expand and take on new work will get you back in the mode of doing high quality. I think that's, I think that's how to do it. Okay, let's, let's take one way on the side here, yeah. The question is, how, how do you think design should work with customer support? I think generally, the, um, you're, you always want new data into your process about making decisions about um, what your product should be. Uh, there's a lot of, I see it as there's a lot of streams of data that are important, right? There's metrics. No one forgets business metrics. When the checks aren't coming in, everyone notices that. There's behavioral metrics. The logs those are pretty easy to get these days. Um, and and when, when customers shout at you, that's also a thing that's very easy to remember. Um, I'm reminded of this, this uh, story we had on Gmail where our support team did a great job of, of um, organizing all of the top issues that people had. And for a couple quarters, the, num the number one issue that people had was there are no folders in Gmail. We want folders in Gmail. What I found was interesting was, you know, at first we were just arrogant and said like, what do you mean? You can look at labels, they're great. And then we thought about it and we dug in and we talked to some people and we realized their, their issue was organization. They were asking for folders but they really cared about was organization. And once we dug into that, then we looked at the UI and at the time there was a little more menu and you pulled down that more menu and there was the organization. We thought, well, no wonder people are, they can't find this stuff, let's just fix it. So you know, we did a little bit of work and that all of a sudden dropped way, way down in the list of needs. So I think it's often when you're working with support, you don't have to build, and this is I think true for sales as well, you don't have to build exactly what people are asking for, but they're great triggers for digging in more and figuring out what people probably need. Yeah. Yeah. What was that last part? Oh, great question. So what are some concrete steps that uh, engineers can take to be better at uh, design? Um, I, uh, when I started design, I, I wasn't very good. And I kept reading books, because that's how I got better at engineering. So I'd read a book, and then I would try to design something, and I would still be bad at it. And I'd read another book, and I did that five times, and I realized this is not working. Either I'm bad at design, and I should pick another profession, or I don't have the right books or something. Now I think about design a lot more like playing piano. And no one expects you to read 10 books about piano and then know how to play piano. Like, that's just not what we expect about, about that skill. And so I think that the, yeah, reading is great, but one of the things you have to do is actually jump in and, and do the work. And like I said, I think there's two modes for that. One is scoping it way down and doing design work within a very tight set of constraints, or finding a mentor that can lead you through a broader design process and give you feedback along the way. I think you really have to do it, you have to learn by doing. Yeah. Yeah. As an overall trend, how do you see that starting to be adopted in engineering organizations? What was that? How do I see what being adopted? Uh, engineers who know how to design. Uh, how often do I see engineers that know how to design? No, no, no. Sorry, I just can't hear. So how do you see that as a trend start to grow? Like, how do you envision that starting to grow as a trend? Like, you can say, Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had like, thoughts on how you can make that a reality. Yeah, yeah. The um, question is, is, how do we move from an area where we just have uh, engineers mostly focused on engineering to a time where most engineers know some, some basic parts about design? Um, I think that there's uh, sort of key parts that if everyone learned, things would run much smoother. 
One simple part of that is, is uh, visual thinking. So we build these things that are just incredibly visual all the time, right? You can use an iPad with your phones on and gloves and like you don't have to touch it. You can, it's all visual. Yet, honestly, we're probably all a little afraid to draw. That's scary. I, know, like, I go to startups and they've got these little dinky whiteboards and you take out the marker, it doesn't even work. It's, it's impossible to draw in some of these places. And so if you have to, if the output of what you're working on is, is so visual and you don't have the tools, that can be a big challenge. Um, and I think it's a challenge because uh, I just started blogging over the last year and I was surprised how much writing helps me think. And I've, I've also realized that the act of drawing helps me think visually. And by not drawing, we're all crippling ourselves and our ability to think visually because we don't go through that process. I think that's, that's one example. So you know, if we all got a little bit better at drawing, a little more comfortable at it and had the tools around, things would be a lot easier. I think a little bit about learning how to do design critique, learning how to tell stories. So I, d I don't think that you know, every, everyone in the organization needs to understand color theory and be able to go into Photoshop and change, understand uh, typography. I don't think that level of stuff is necessary, but the parts where we work together, I think we can be a lot better. I think. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be fun to find out. Yeah? So what's the role of the A-B testing? What's the role of A-B testing? Yeah, small engineer or design? I, I don't know. I like A-B testing. It's, it's one of many techniques that I think you can use to, to, to figure out what works. Um, uh, yeah. It, it's, it's very fast, and oftentimes it won't tell you why it's not working, but um, when you need to really optimize a particular flow, it can be a great, great tool. Yeah. Cool. We'll have three more questions. Yeah, way in the back. Uh, for, for a startup, do you recommend, uh, if we're trying to remove a designer, do you recommend hiring a web designer that also knows how to code, or do you recommend hiring a separate that will find out what that team the question is, for a startup, would I recommend finding a designer who knows how to code? I think it's always a benefit when a designer uh, can code. I actually don't recommend looking for it for a startup. And that's partly because I think it's a lot easier to find people who can do front-end web development these days than it is to find people who can do great design work. And because with that big skill matrix, you want to cover as many of them as possible, I would much rather have someone who's great at interaction design and great at user research and can't code much and understands constraints in whatever platform they're doing, but doesn't know JavaScript or Objective-C. I would much prefer that than the, than the opposite, because I know I can build a great engineering team that, that can fill that, that gap OK. But you know, if great people come along, you should hire them. <laughs> All right. Oh, OK, yeah. Is this recording going to be available somewhere? Is this recording going to be available somewhere? Yes. We'll find out after. Maybe YouTube. Wait. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Okay, last one. Uh, you have touched the, uh, the story of the design process. I'd be curious, do you have any kind of or uh, any particular skill set that you can acquire you know, to fit into that story? Yeah, the question is, uh, since I talk about storytelling, are there concrete examples and uh, are there skills that people can have to, to to get good at that. Um, it ends up being, um, actually a lot of the way I work with startups is we uh, start to think about what are the dozen stories that if they were true, everything would work in your company. And often there's not that many that you actually have to think about. It's like, okay, people hear about us and can sign up. People you know, come in day after day and get a lot of value out of it. Maybe there's a couple stories around that. And once you have those, then you, then you start to design all the different parts of how those stories work. Um, I don't know, I'd be happy to talk afterwards about how I've applied that in a couple of different places. Um, I think this, the skills involved actually are not, um, are not that difficult because I don't think you have to build large narrative arcs or you know, even design big presentations like this in order to do it well. You just have to realize that what you're designing is more of a movie and less of a painting. Very concretely, um, I've, I learned long ago that it's much better to send movies to people over email than mock-ups. So now I never send mock-ups to people ever, even if it's a bug report. I'll crack open my, my screen recording tool, show how it's broken, and send that in, in a video. That works so much better in communicating how things are working or, or not working than, than a static image. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll be up here afterwards, happy to chat. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Thanks.